Hi everyone, welcome to Preparing People with HIV for Involvement and Community Engagement Activities, Elevate Webinar. We're delighted that you're here and excited that you've joined us. We would like to acknowledge that the Elevate program is supported at 100% by HRSA. The contents of this presentation are those of the authors and do not necessarily represent the official views of nor an endorsement by HRSA, HHS, or the US government. We wanna take time to acknowledge and thank our partners for the Elevate program. NMAC is leading Elevate in partnership with JSI Research and Training Institute, the Association of Nurses and AIDS Care, the Latino Commission on AIDS, and ICF. We're gonna start off with a few introductions. My name is Reginald Warren. I'm a public health consultant with JSI, and I'm honored and excited to be here with you all today. I'm joined today by Lauren Miller with NMAC and my colleagues from JSI, Michelle Dawson, and Robbie Floyd. Robbie, I pass it to you. Hi, everyone. My name is Robbie Floyd. I'm a project associate with JSI, and I'll be co-leading today's webinar alongside Reggie. So let's start by going over what we'll cover in today's webinar. By the end of the webinar, participants will be able to describe the value of involvement of people with HIV in community engagement activities, identify three HIV prevention and or service delivery initiatives that include community engagement activities, understand the purpose of three types of community engagement activities, explain the desired membership of three types of community engagement activities, and identify three resources that can be used to prepare for active involvement in community engagement activities. A few house or Zoom keeping considerations to have in mind during our session today. Please note that this webinar will be recorded and will be available to you after the webinar. Also, please engage non-verbally in the webinar using the reactions that's displayed. We will take questions at the end of the presentation. And at that time, we ask that you raise your hand using the Zoom feature and we will call on participants to ask their questions. All right, let's get started. Let's start by talking about what community engagement is. Community engagement is a process of developing relationships that enable stakeholders to work together to address health-related issues and promote well-being to achieve positive health impact and outcomes. At its core, community engagement enables changes in behavior, environments, policies, programs, and practices within the communities. HRSA's Ryan White HIV AIDS program, recipients and providers, supported by one or more parts of the Ryan White program, have been longtime leaders in implementing community engagement activities to meet the needs of hard to reach and underserved populations. By including people with HIV in planning and coordinating of HIV care, these integrative efforts result in improved health outcomes such as sustained linkage to care and increased viral suppression rates among people with HIV who receive medical care through HRSA's Ryan White program. Of course, we know that no one knows what the community needs and how well the system is serving people with HIV better than the community itself. So we'll begin by talking about the value of involvement of people with HIV in community engagement activities. As you may recall from training day one, in the early 1980s, people with HIV and AIDS fought to ensure that people with lived experience were involved in the planning, implementation, improvement of HIV AIDS care and treatment and overall decision making. The people with AIDS, as they were known at the time, established the different principles as a basis for self-empowerment and self-determination. Those principles were the foundation of the involve, of involvement of people living with HIV and a catalyst for many key events in the HIV movement and informed efforts of other marginalized communities. Those vital efforts continue and are critical as we discussed our webinar, in our webinar entitled Preparing for Enrollment in HIV Service Delivery. Your voices matter most in all federal, state, and local efforts to meet the needs of people living with HIV and addressing existing barriers. You know best how we may improve our efforts to not only prevent new infections and end the HIV epidemic, but care for the 1.2 million individuals currently living with HIV. An excellent example of the unique value people living with HIV bring to the table, even at the policy level, 
includes the development of the Demanding Better HIV Federal Policy Agenda, which was developed by member networks of the US People Living with HIV Caucus, a network of networks, so to speak. The authors outline key recommendations that directly improve upon efforts outlined in both the National HIV AIDS Strategy and the Ending the Epidemic. While many priorities are highlighted, on a call where Harold Phillips, director of the White House Office of National AIDS Policy was present, present there was a resounding message of the need for quality of life for people with HIV to be prioritized and for there to be a pillar focused solely on this along with related metrics. The director responded that this was extremely helpful and noted that this request both aligns with and will inform the updates to come from the White House in December. In addition to potential areas for involvement at the policy level, there are many areas and opportunities for involvement within HIV prevention and care planning related efforts. Let's take a look at a few. There are an array of opportunities for involvement of persons with HIV in community engagement activities, including prevention and care planning activities, both at the state and local levels, as you can see displayed here. There are a few entities listed that perform integrated prevention and care planning activities, meaning their efforts focus on both HIV prevention and care related activities rather than one over the others, as some do. Those on this list that do so can be distinguished by the asterisk next to each of them. Let's dive into the details of some of the activities listed above. Before municipality, called an eligible metropolitan area or transitional grant area can receive Ryan White program Part A funds. The chief elected officials, the CEO, usually who's the mayor, is required to appoint people to a planning council or planning body. Because the CEO will have a number of other responsibilities beyond the planning council, they will often appoint a lead agency, usually the health department, to manage the grant. We'll call this delegate the recipient. The Ryan White HIV AIDS program legislation requires planning councils to have members from various types of groups and organizations, including people living with HIV who live in the jurisdiction. A key function of the planning council is to provide the consumer and community voice in decision making about medical and support services to be funded with the jurisdiction's Ryan White Part A dollars. The planning council conducts integrated and comprehensive planning, determines priorities and decides how to allocate resources, and works to ensure a system of care that provides equitable access to care and needed services, services to all eligible people living with HIV in the jurisdiction. This is really unique and special. The Ryan Wyatt HIV AIDS Program Part A funds are the only funds required by law to have a consumer input into how the funds are spent to make sure that they are truly meeting the needs of the community and the mechanism by which they do that are planning councils and planning bodies. So the active and informed involvement of people with HIV in planning councils and planning bodies is absolutely critical. Let's learn a little more about them. Ryan White Program Part A planning councils and planning bodies are required to develop the rules that will govern how the council is run. This includes bylaws, policies, and procedures, grievance procedures, conflict of interest policies and procedures, procedures that ensure open meetings and an open nominations process to identify nominees for the planning council. Members conduct a community needs assessment to identify what services are needed by and, which, and by which populations and what barriers are faced by people living with HIV in the jurisdiction. The council will review the findings to learn what services are most needed by the people with HIV in the jurisdiction and to make decisions about how Ryan White program Part A dollars should be allocated across service categories. The council may also provide guidance to the recipient on service models, targeting of populations or service areas, and other ways to best meet the identified priorities. In collaboration with the recipient, the council develops a long-term plan on how to provide these services, also known as an integrated or comprehensive planning plan. The council also reviews services needed and the ways that Ryan White Part A works to fill the gaps in care and other Ryan White parts through the statewide coordinated statement of need. Lastly, the planning council evaluates how efficiently providers are selected and paid by the recipient. The membership of planning councils is fairly prescribed in order to ensure that people with HIV who are involved in the council are able to truly participate. The council also includes other types of members representing different viewpoints on HIV service delivery in the community. The membership of planning councils must include people living with HIV and community, including members of federally recognized Indian tribes as represented in the population, individuals co-infected with hepatitis B or C, and historically underserved groups or subpopulations. 
In fact, 33% of the planning council members must be consumers of Ryan White Part A services. Moreover, planning council membership must reflect the epidemic in the jurisdiction in terms of race and ethnicity, gender, gender identity, gender expression, and age, or any other factors. Public health and health planning agencies, which include mental health, substance abuse providers, state Medicaid agencies, and agencies administering the Ryan White Part B program should be involved, as well as health and social service providers, including federally qualified health centers, community-based organizations, social, social service providers, and mental health and substance use treatment providers. Lastly, federal HIV programs, such as the other Ryan White Parts and the recipients of other HIV grant programs will be involved. By having such a diverse group, the planning councils and planning bodies are able to look at the system of care from a variety of perspectives in order to determine what their needs are, how they can be met, and what will work, what work still needs to be done. States that receive Ryan White HIV AIDS program Part B dollars are required to obtain community input as, community, as a component of integrated planning activities for the use of Ryan White Part B resources. And many states do this through the Ryan White Part B advisory groups, often called Part B planning bodies. A state can choose to oversee integrated planning activities itself through statewide or regional planning groups, or can assign the responsibility to consortium. Consortia are associations of public and non-profit healthcare and support service providers and community-based organizations that the state contracts with to provide planning, resource allocation, and contracting program and fiscal monitoring and required reporting. Some are statewide groups while others cover specific local areas or regions. Some regional consortia also directly deliver medical support, medical and support services. Ryan White HIV AIDS program Part B planning bodies provide input into the development of the integrated HIV prevention and care plan which describes the organization and delivery of health, HIV health care and support services, addresses unmet need, is coordinated with HIV prevention and substance use abuse treatment programs and other support services. It is also consistent with the statewide coordinated statement of need and the CDC required HIV prevention comprehensive plan. Planning bodies can play the roles displayed on your screen, which include providing input on a work plan for the development of the integrated plan, assist with data collection, help develop goals and objectives to be included in the plan, review a draft of the integrated planning activities and provide feedback, review progress in implementing the integrated planning activities and provide input regarding necessary changes annually. While it is not required for uh, Ryan White Program Part B planning bodies, um, are strongly encouraged to follow the membership composition required for Ryan White Part A planning councils. Also, unlike Ryan White Part A planning councils, there is no legislative requirement for the involvement of this group in decision-making. It is important to note that these planning bodies are not necessarily accessed as easily as other community engagement activities. In addition to having planning bodies to support planning for Ryan White Part B broadly, Part B recipients are also strongly encouraged to have ADAP specific advisory committees. Though Ryan White HIV A program legislation does not mandate the specific committee, most states convene one as best practice. The ADAP advisory committees task and focus areas include providing guidance and recommendation on ADAP operations, modifications to ADAP formulary and eligibility criteria, and assessment of potential ADAP cost effectiveness strategies. These committees also provide feedback and guidance on ADAP's quality, Management plan, the advisory committee may meet in person by conference call or electronically. ADAP advisory committees meeting frequency varies from state to state depending on the role of the committee and the needs of the ADAP. State ADAP advisory committees are typically comprised of consumers, clinicians, pharmacists, service providers, representatives from other Ryan White parts, health department staff, and state Medicaid program staff. The intent of this diversity is to ensure the group has a breadth of expertise on key issues of concern to ADAPs, including financing, clinical care, consumer needs, and systems issues for public and private sector programs. The purpose of the clinic quality management committees are to support the development of the Ryan White HIV AIDS program recipient and or subrecipients in ensuring they are delivering high quality HIV care 
and provide support for improving health outcomes among the patient population. These committees are also help to develop strategies for ensuring that such services are consistent with the guidelines for improvement in the access to and quality of HIV services. The Clinical Quality Management Committee is responsible for coordination and evaluation of all activities aimed at improving, improving patient care, health outcomes, and patient satisfaction. This includes the development and implementation of a quality management plan. As a part of this plan uh, development, the committee identifies specific aims and related performance measures to monitor patient care, patient satisfaction, and health outcomes. The committee creates a system for data collection and determines the process and timeline for analyzing related data. The committee also oversees quality improvement activities, including the selection of the approach or methodology that will be used to understand if the specific changes or improvements made have a positive impact on patient health outcomes, or if they show that the services need to continue to evolve in order to meet goals. The Ryan White HIV AIDS Program Clinical Quality Management Committees are typically comprised of Ryan White Program consumers. Consumers are people with HIV served by the Ryan White Program. The consumers involved in the CQM committee should be reflective of the population that is being served. A CQM committee reflective of the epidemic helps ensure that the needs of uh, people with HIV served by the Ryan White Program are being addressed by the CQM activities. Membership also includes stakeholders such as subrecipients, other, other recipient region planning bodies, and or its committees, consumers, clinicians, pharmacists, service providers, representatives from other Ryan White HIV AIDS program parts, health department staff, and state Medicaid program staff. It is important to note that for some recipient and subrecipients, this committee may also be responsible for specific ADAP related quality management activities discussed earlier. Many healthcare agencies seek, to seek input from clients through formal advisory boards. Clinics funded by Ryan White HIV AIDS programs utilize a community advisory board often called a CAB model. Consumer advisory boards provide clinics with patient and or client input and guidance on the design and delivery of care. Through CABs, consumers' perspectives are incorporated into the continual assessment and improvement cycle for policies, direct services, data management, and fiscal systems are continually assessed and improved. The CAB represents the community in making sure activities are carried out in a way that best meets consumers' needs. Most importantly, the CAB is the means by which providers, consumers, and the community communicate with each other. The CAB members can serve as a link between providers and the community, giving the community information about services and bringing community concerns and ideas back to the provider. CAB members are responsible for opening ongoing dialogue with consumers in their community and serving as their representative within the organization. CAB members gather feedback from community members and share out on the availability of services and activities of the CAB. Following this, members are able to share any concerns or new ideas from the community with the providers. Members of the CAB are also encouraged to present the activities of the CAB to the agency, voted on by the entire CAB membership. Some participants may also serve in leadership roles such as chair, vice chair, secretary, or treasurer. In these roles, members may have additional responsibilities, such as planning the agenda for meetings, serving as the primary link between the CAB and the agency, taking notes and distributing them among members, and keeping track of the CAB budget. The CAB membership is drawn from consumers within the recipient or subrecipient service areas. Any individuals infected or affected by HIV may become a member. The CAB seeks to have a diverse membership as possible so that the perspectives of all ages, races, ethnic groups, sexual orientation, and other identities are represented. In February of 2019, the president announced that ending the HIV epidemic, EHE, in America initiative. The initiative seeks to leverage powerful data, tools, and resources to reduce new HIV infections by 90% over the next 10 years. The EHE initiative focuses on 48 counties The plan focuses first on 50 local areas that account for more than half of new HIV diagnoses. So 48 counties, San, including San Juan, Puerto Rico, and Washington, DC, and seven states with a substantial rural burden. 
The goal of the EHG is to provide a more coordinated HIV planning effort across funding streams and agencies. Each jurisdiction has at least one, some more than one HIV planning groups that are tasked with working with the local health department to inform the development or update of the health department's jurisdictional HIV prevention plan. That will contribute to the reduction of HIV infection in the jurisdiction. The plan is aligned with the national HIV AIDS strategy. Similar to other community planning councils and bodies, the EHE HIV planning groups are responsible for developing bylaws and procedures, including criteria for the selection of its members, ensuring that there is representation of those affected by and living with HIV, it is vital that the group members are able to equally participate and carry out planning tasks or duties in the planning process. To do so, health departments and, and HPG members are to provide a thorough orientation for new members. The planning tasks and duties of the group include selecting a community co-chair who will work with the health department co-chair. The group also informs the development of or updates of the health department's jurisdictional HIV prevention plan and engagement process working to ensure that it is inclusive of and guided by high impact prevention activities. The planning group also identifies and informs how the jurisdiction may collaborate to accomplish activities outlined in the plan. In collaboration with the health department, the, the HIV planning group reviews its process and progress each year, noting any challenges they've experienced and changes needed or made. The ending the HIV epidemic HIV planning group should reflect the local epidemic by involving representatives of populations with high prevalence of HIV infection and should also include HIV service providers. For example, community-based organizations, care providers from the public and private sectors, community health centers, mental health and substance abuse services, other governmental and non-governmental entities, non-traditional providers such as medical education training centers and community foundations and philanthropic entities. Members should also be representative of varying races, ethnicities, genders, sexual orientations, ages, and other characteristics such as varying educational backgrounds, professions, and expertise. The Fast Track Cities Initiative is a global partnership between cities and municipalities around the world and four core partners, the International Association of Providers of AIDS Care, the Joint United Nations Program on HIV AIDS, the United Nations Human Settlements Program, and the City of Paris. Mayors and other city or municipal officials around the world designate their cities as Fast Track Cities by signing the Paris Declaration on Fast Track Cities, which, out, which outlines a set of commitments to, achievement, to achieve the initiative objectives. The initiative's objectives include attaining a 90-90-90, that is 90% of people living with HIV aware of their status, 90% of diagnosed people living with HIV on ART, and 90% of people living with HIV on ART with sustained viral suppression, as well as zero discrimination and stigma targets. Additionally, city officials commit to achieving seven object the seven objectives displayed. In addition to the above higher level commitments, Fast Track Cities agreed to work with the International Association of Providers of AIDS Care and other partners to implement the FTCI based on a four-point implementation strategy. Most important to our conversation, this includes a requirement for cities to convene a task force and or advisory committee to focus on developing and building consensus around metrics for success and a city specific implementation plan to achieve the FTCI's objectives. While many cities already have a leadership group in place, IPAC provides a technical package that includes template documents, presentations, and guidelines that can assist with attaining the 90-90-90 and zero discrimination and stigma targets. Additionally, the strategy also includes maintaining an open line of communication surrounding progress challenges and opportunities to further accelerate their urban HIV AIDS responses. Using an online web portal, participant, participating cities are able to share their data and collaborate to discuss and brainstorm responses, any challenges that they may have had by similar jurisdictions. Each participating city must convene a task force or an advisory committee. In the US, this group may or may not be aligned with one of the other HIV community planning or advisory groups that exist. Participating municipalities commit to developing an action plan for their city's efforts, embracing the transparent use of data, regularly measuring results and adjusting responses to the faster, smarter, and more effective. 
participate in cities, support other cities and municipalities, and share their experiences, knowledge, and data about what works and what can be improved. Cities then report annually on progress towards their goals. The Fast Track Cities Initiative incorporates a commitment for each of its signatories, that is cities, to meaningfully include people with HIV in decision-making around policies and programs that affect their lives. Fast Track Cities may coordinate with other HIV community planning groups that exist within the municipality. For instance, other Ryan White Part A planning council and planning bodies or integrated planning groups, but are not necessarily required to do so. The incorporation of this commitment to meaningfully including people with HIV in the planning group demonstrates the importance of having people with HIV involved in efforts to meet the needs of people with HIV and in the epidemic. So we just talked through a number of different planning groups that you could be a part of. Now that we've done so, let's talk about some things you can do to help prepare to be involved. We'll overview a few different training programs you can participate in that will help give you the skills you'll need to really use your voice and make a difference in your community. First, you could apply to participate in MX block program. The goal of the block program is to increase the number of persons of color living with HIV who are prepared to engage in leadership roles and activities related to HIV service delivery. Successful applicants will be asked to identify opportunities to engage and participate meaningfully in decision-making bodies and planning boards that serve people living with HIV. If you choose to participate, you will be expected to participate in monthly webinars, conference calls, attend a three-day training, and actively engage in your local community to improve health outcomes for people living with HIV. The Block Program and its partners are committed to racial justice and health equity with a focus on those communities disproportionately vulnerable due to injustice and discrimination based on race, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, or HIV status. The training is designed to uplift and enhance the voices of those communities that are overrepresented in the number of new cases of HIV, but underrepresented in current leadership. The program is a great way to learn about how you can be more involved and prepare yourself to fully participate in HIV service delivery activities. Of course, another great training program is Elevate, engage leadership through employment, validation, and advancing transformation and equity for persons with HIV program. The purpose of the Elevate program is to build the capacity for persons with HIV to be meaningfully involved in the planning, delivering, and improving of Ryan White HIV AIDS program services. And it's through Elevate, which we're offering today's webinar. Elevate will address needs in workforce recruitment, development, and advancement for persons with HIV in populations 50 years or older, young black men, transgender nonconforming, Latinx, and the recovery community. The program engages participants through virtual workshops and webinars tailored to support people with HIV through leadership training to support participation and inclusion of persons with HIV in the healthcare workforce by providing technically and culturally responsive services. This includes leadership and planning bodies, consumer advisory boards, clinical quality management teams, and boards of directors, as well as positions such as community health workers, peer specialists, patient navigators, and peer outreach workers. Elevate builds on the achievements of HRSA's training programs and covers topics including systems level leadership, the basics of HIV prevention, care and treatment, public health tools and skills, such as health literacy data, data terminology, performance management, and reading graphs and charts, as well as how to create change within organizations. If you're looking for more information about the Ryan White HIV AIDS Program Part A Planning Councils and their activities, I recommend you check out the Planning Council Primer developed by HRSA's Planning Chat Project. The Primer explains what Ryan White HIV AIDS Program does and describes what Planning Councils do in helping make decisions about what Ryan White Program services to fund and deliver in their geographic areas. The Primer is intended to be a basic reference to help prepare planning council members to actively engage in planning council activities and effectively carry out their legislative defined community health planning duties. While most Ryan White HIV AIDS program part A jurisdictions have planning councils, a few smaller areas have planning bodies, which serve the same purpose, but are not subject to the same legislative requirements as planning councils. The primer describes the expectations of planning councils. There are no specific requirements for types of planning bodies. However, the health resources 
in services administration, and HRSA encourages such planning bodies to be as similar as possible to planning councils in their membership and to carry out the same activities as planning councils, as outlined in the legislation. Therefore, this primer should be useful to planning bodies as well as planning councils. Available both in English and Spanish is an excellent resource for any community planning group. We'll now take some time for questions. Should you have any questions um, after the webinar, please feel free to reach out directly to Charles or Lauren and their contact information is displayed on the screen. Thanks for coming.